on Health Matters Television for Life, The Power and Price of Addiction. With marijuana legal in Washington State, police officers have a new problem. People believe that just because they can buy marijuana or smoke marijuana, that they can drive after consuming it. And it's not just pot. Hear what the medical community is saying about the impact of drug abuse and how to prevent and treat it. Right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by viewers like you, the friends of KSBS, and by the following. One great thing about working at Providence is that I have the technology and the support for our type of complex patients. I'm Dr. Carl Garabedian and I chose Providence because here I can provide the highest level of care to children of our region. Find your doctor online at phc.org. Providence's motto is know me, care for me, ease my way. And Providence does that. I've seen it over and over again. I'm Dr. Stephen Murray and I chose Providence because I believe in their mission statement. And working together with others of like mind is a very powerful way to take care of patients. According to survey data released in 2012 by the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids, 10% of all American adults ages 18 and older consider themselves to be in recovery from drug or alcohol abuse problems. Good evening, I'm Teresa Lukens, the host of Health Matters. Tonight our focus is on addiction in its many forms from illegal drugs to alcohol, even prescription medication. Joining me for this discussion is our distinguished panel. Carla Dvorak is a member of the faculty at Spokane Falls Community College. She works in the Addiction Studies program. Neil Hayden is the founder of Gateway Counseling. Before that, he was the program coordinator for chemical dependency services at Deaconess Medical Center. Shannon Panther is a clinical assistant professor in the pharmacotherapy department at Washington State University. And Kat Armstrong is a clinical supervisor working with people of all ages coping with addiction. And I want to welcome our panel. And before we get started with our discussion tonight, we want to somewhat put a face on addiction, see what it looks like, and how do people end up in treatment. We sat down with Bill Bennett, who was gracious enough to tell us his story. At age 37, he's been in recovery for two years now and four months, and says getting clean saved his life. I was a general manager with Marriott for, oh gosh, about seven years and just kind of worked my way up from the bottom from being a bell person to being eventually being a general manager. Very stressful. I think during the height of everything, uh, when things really started to get hard for me was I was living and working in South Beach and I was working at a very prominent hotel uh, right there, you know, on Ocean Boulevard. And so I was meeting rich and famous people. The expectations were extremely high. The drinking became quite heavily at that point. Um, it became heavier than it had probably ever been. Uh, maybe it had been heavy in the past, maybe it had kind of waxed and waned, but during this period the pressure was really immense. Then along came the cocaine. The cocaine was great in the beginning. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, but you know, as time goes on, the more you use, you start to kind of lose touch with reality. What I found was that by two or three o'clock in the afternoon, I just couldn't wait to get out of the office and to go home to have that drink. Sometimes working five or six hours a day, and you know, as in my position as a general manager, a 10 hour a day is, is you know, more proper. I had started to pay some serious health consequences around that time and I took a real big crash and um, came close, very close to death. I ended up coming back here from Florida to Spokane uh, and I spent two years recovering with my family. It took two trips here locally through inpatient um, here in Washington State for me to finally come around. The longer that you're in recovery, the longer that you're working on that, you don't lose focus on your recovery, but it, it, it's not something that's consuming you every day anymore. You start to you start to regain your freedom back. The person I am now is just a person that I feel very free um, from alcohol. I don't worry about it anymore. Um, it's not a part of my life. I'm more focused on the future. 
And Bill is currently going to college. He wants to work with seniors facing mental health issues. Bill says that he is inspired by his own grandmother. And uh, Carly, you know Bill personally. Yes, I do. This story is close to you. Tell us a little bit more about him. He doesn't seem to us, I guess, like he's out of central casting, certainly, for the drug addict and mm -hmm. what we see in movies or you know what people typically think of as being a drug addict. Bill's his own unique person, but he also captures some of the passion that people in recovery have to want to make the world a better place for other people. And um, so he's living that miracle of coming from a time when his own life was in such terrible straits. And now he volunteers. He comes to my class still to, to speak to the students and to give them their, his perspective. He's, uh, he's typical in that way. What I find with recovering people is that um, lifelong desire to help another person up. You have a lot of your students that are in recovery, recovering mm -hmm. addicts, because they want that path in life. They want to help others get through that. Absolutely, and that's what makes teaching so fun. Uh, there isn't anybody in my classes that doesn't have that desire to make the world better. And so many of them are coming from the depths of despair, mm -hmm. uh, but have been able to turn that around and now have such a passion one of my colleagues said uh, that they really fight for that seat in that classroom with their own life. Neil, is this a typical story? Can we call it anything typical at this point when it comes to addiction? Well, I think that the face of addiction affects different people in different ways. Uh, and it crosses all the socioeconomic boundaries. I mean, you can be behind in your glass castle, downtown Spokane, overlooking the river, or you can be down at the Union Gospel Mission and every place in between. Uh, addiction is no respecter of how much money you have. Mm -hmm. It is no respecter of where your house is. It is no respecter of any th normal characteristic of humanity. It, it, it invades wherever it can. Mm -hmm. And so the typical view of an addict or an alcoholic is not really typical, it's atypical. Because we think of late stage chronic addicts and alcoholics as that's what that is. What they don't see is people living on high drive that have problems, or people living in uh, their nice little uh, suburban uh, neighborhoods that have problems, or physicians or doctors or attorneys that have problems. Or 16-year-olds. Or 16-year-old mm -hmm. kids or 12-year-old mm -hmm. kids. And they, do, do they know that they have a problem, typically, those people that we're talking about that might not be what we typically think of as an addict? I think some Do they recognize some it? may, but the majority probably not. They, they don't recognize it as a problem, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. He uh, started with alcohol and then went to cocaine. Is that also a pattern that you quite often see? Alcohol? Mm -hmm. The gateway? Could, could it be a gateway? Mm -hmm. Sure. Is it necessarily? I also know a lot of people that have addiction problems that don't drink yeah. alcohol. Mm -hmm. They figure, oh, I don't need alcohol, I have this. So what often brings them to recovery? Pain. Causes a problem. <laughs> Pain. Something yeah, happens yeah. in their life that, that causes a Nobody problem. just tap dances and, and, mm -hmm. and, and strolls into a treatment center think, saying, gee, I think I'd like to go to treatment. <laughs> <laughs> They're always either pushed by something, whether it be family, uh, the court systems, their employer, uh, wives, kids, moms, dads. Health health issues. Yeah. Or they've just gotten sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's so much out there now. It's, it's hard. To, I mean, we're talking about street drugs, certainly. We're also talking about prescription drugs, alcohol, nicotine, those things that our bodies can become addicted to. Is it physical, mental, or both, Kat? I think that it is a very physical disease and it has a mental component to it. So we know that there's a chemical imbalance of the brain with people with chemical dependency, that they tend to be deficient in serotonin and keflins, endorphins and GABA. And that may not mean like a whole lot, but the serotonin is I'm okay with myself and I'm okay with the world. The endorphins are our ability to handle physical pain and keflins are our ability to handle emotional psychological pain and the GABA is our ability to handle stress. So they're born deficient. They've done a lot of studies and they find that most addicts are one third deficient in this. And what it sets them up with is I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough, I gotta try harder, and I gotta try harder to fit in. And the first time they use, it fits in there like lock and key, and what happens is, they take one drink and they think, I feel good. Take two drinks, 
doggone it, I look good. By three or four drinks or six or seven drinks, they think everybody thinks they look good. And they go to the bar and they think there's nobody in here I can't have if I want them. And it's really a physiological thing, but it does manifest itself in psychological pain. And so it, it impacts every part of your life, your mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, financial. There isn't a single part of life that chemical dependency does not impact. And yet, Shannon, we use drugs in some cases mm -hmm. to treat addictions. We do. That's a fine line. Talk a little bit about that and, and how that works. Sure. So depending upon the drug of choice, um, we can try and use another prescription drug with, that will last longer in the body to try and help prevent some of those symptoms that start occurring as we begin to withdraw. So. Do they then, so you're taking them off mm -hmm. one drug. And replacing it with another. And replacing it with another. How do they not become addicted to that second drug then? They don't necessarily not become addicted. Mm. Um, the, the goal would be to eventually taper somebody off of that second drug, but sometimes that doesn't happen, or it can be very difficult to do. Talk about some of those addictive drugs then that could be treated with other drugs. So we could take something like heroin and we could use methadone instead. Um, heroin lasts uh, six or so hours in the body versus methadone, which lasts closer to, to 12, 16, depending upon how that person metabolizes. So we don't have peaks and valleys. And that obviously requires a prescription. Mm -hmm. So they need to be, do they need to be in a treatment program? They do. Yes. To, mm -hmm. to acquire those drugs? Is mm -hmm. that how that works? Mm -hmm. Either in a treatment program or prescribed by a physician for any multitude mm -hmm. of. Right. Uh, reasons. Well, Usually and, pain management. Right. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, people watching this show might be able to better relate to that if they do think about nicotine. Because if you have someone who's dependent on nicotine and it's causing serious health problems, who wouldn't say, hey, have you tried Chantex? Have you tried Zyban? How mm -hmm. about those patches? Anything to help that person get to abstinence. So one of the ways I like to think about it is the medications are abstinence enhancers, something that helps that person ultimately get to abstinence. But I agree with you that there's uh, some of those hardcore dependencies that that doesn't happen with. But um, I think our field has to grow in that area because the old standby line was a drug's a drug's a drug as a drug. And when we started realizing mental health issues that are co-occurring with substance issues, if we're not allowing our practitioners to have an open mind to using medications, mm -hmm. whether it be to balance depression or other kinds of issues, then we're doing harm instead of helping. Mm -hmm. right. And Kat, those are exactly the patients you work with. It is the patients that I work with. And very often we get people coming in and they're being prescribed benzodiazepines. So they're schizophrenic and they're uh, general anxiety disorder. And it's very common that people get prescribed benzodiazepines. They're highly addictive, however. So what we do is when they're coming into our agency and they're drinking, we treat the alcoholism. We get in contact with the doctors, making sure that they're monitoring the benzodiazepines or we treat the marijuana addiction or whatever the addiction is, and we allow them to take those medications. So you actually need to form a team to speak of to treat that particular patient. Yes, we do. And, and at my agency, what I have is I have mental health professionals and I have chemical dependency professionals working um, together with one client. I have people going out to the gospel mission. I have people going out to a charity house or to the hospitals. And we're it's a little different than the straight CD program on one side, we have straight CD on the other side, we have the dual diagnosis because we give them a little more wiggle room. You know, a lot of CD agencies, if you relapse, ASAM says, okay, now you need to go in patient, whatever. And we're working with these people and because a lot of them are resistant to going in inpatient and there is no real involuntary laws. They have them out there, but you can go to detox involuntary if you leave, the, there's no consequences. Different with the mental health though. So we have a lot of people who are court ordered to mental health treatment who come to our agency and if they don't fall through, we can call MHPs and they get detained back to the hospital. So it's a little more uh, punch to it as far as that yeah, goes. Yeah, a lot more pieces to that puzzle. It is, it is. And then 
when you're dealing with the clients, you have to present information that talks both about their chemical dependency and their mental illness. So, you know, they're not just struggling with one disease, they're struggling with both, and both are primary diseases. Mm -hmm. So some people say, oh, just treat the CD and then we'll mm -hmm. get the mental health later, or let's treat the mental health and we'll get the CD later. But if you don't treat both simultaneously, what happens is I treat CD, they relapse mental health, they're going to use anyways. I treat mental health, they end up uh, not be, or train, treat the CD and they don't stabilize mental health, then they'll end up using because they mm -hmm. self-medicate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these people are saying, hey, listen, I smoke the pot because it helps me with my anxiety or it helps me out with my depression. The problem is pot doesn't equal <laughs> neurotransmitters that they actually need to the, treat their Yeah, diseases. that needs to treat their other problem that they have. Neil, inpatient, outpatient, um, talk about the two and how they, they work and help and benefit uh, someone in recovery. Why is someone necessarily admitted and someone else isn't? Well, I think inpatient treatment is designed for people that can't maintain abstinence in an outpatient setting. That's what its primary purpose is. Mm -hmm. It pulls them out of the environment. It puts them in a controlled setting where theoretically they can't use. And then once they become stable, they can integrate into an outpatient treatment program where they get to sleep in their own bed and be around their own family, but they have enough clinical support so they can maintain abstinence. Now, the American Society for Addiction Medicine has this fluid program that uh, we're supposed to subscribe to that will move people in intensity depending on what is happening with them and how stable or unstable they become. Uh, at Gateway, we take that stuff pretty serious as far as moving people around and meeting them where they're at. Um, but inpatient, again, is for people that can't maintain abstinence, and outpatient has multiple levels of support depending on how the person is doing personally. And so if they have an adequate sober support system, if they're internally motivated and are demonstrating that, if they have a concrete relapse prevention strategy, uh, they don't need me because treatment is temporary. Yeah. It doesn't go on forever. But yet you're always in recovery. Well, you're in recovery as long as you do what is necessary to stay in recovery. Mm -hmm. it's, it, I, I, I wish I had a magic wand and I could wave it over their head and say, oh gee, your chemical dependency is gone. You'll never think about it ever again. You'll never use again, but that isn't the way it works. It requires a huge amount of effort on an individual basis in order to maintain recovery, which is way more than just not using. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Shannon, there's a lot more people turning to street drugs, it seems now. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of restrictions put on, on prescription Absolutely. drugs. Is that why they're, why they're turning to street drugs? Is this going to continue to be a problem? I, I believe it's a matter of access. Um, with, with the changes that are occurring, for prescribing as well as dispensing. For instance, hydrocodone um, products just became class two narcotics on Monday the 6th. So with that change, now a prescriber who is trying to treat pain, um, they need to write a new prescription each and every time. Their, their prescribing habits are going to be under a microscope. They're going to be writing for smaller quantities um, and so these patients who have pain that we're treating, when they come into the pharmacy, then the pharmacies are doing more to go through their checks and balances, do what they, their due diligence to make sure that the, the treatment is appropriate. And um, our, our patients then are getting small quantities, but their pain might not be managed quite mm. as well. So they're going to look for other sources. And that's where we're seeing more drugs like heroin coming mm -hmm. back into play, which was starting to sort of, well, right. I wouldn't say go away, but mm -hmm. becoming less prevalent. And now we're seeing it come back into mm -hmm. play. Is that the mm -hmm. case? Mm -hmm. That is the case. Mm -hmm. And um, the alarming part is the age. Yeah, younger and younger. Um, many of the people that, that contact our agency, whether they're going to be able to come to our agency or not, are in their teens. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. And uh, they get introduced to farm parties, which mm -hmm. is uh, pharmaceuticals that they, you know, they go swipe out of their parents' cabinets okay. and put them all, right. all together and they go out and they play with those things when they're 12 and 13 years old. Uh, they discover opioid pain medications, which uh, they like, and it grabs them by the throat mm -hmm. and won't let go. And now they're spending 80 to 100 to 150 bucks a day to, to stop being sick. 
and then that gets too expensive, and then they run into heroin, yeah. mm -hmm. which is about half the price. Well, and I've had clients who had legitimate pain issues. So like teens who started out and they're playing sports and they actually get hurt. And because they have the genetic predisposition, they get hooked onto the opiates. Well, the doctor cuts them off when the leg heals and they're still addicted to it. And then they're out there and they're looking for the heroin because it's way of cheaper. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's very easy. It's to easy get. to get. Yes. It is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, I do encourage your phone calls and your emails this evening for our panel. Please feel free to call and we'll start with an email tonight. Uh, unless you live with chronic pain, you have no idea of the devastation that it causes in the life of a person who must endure it. Healthcare workers develop rude behaviors when we are treated and were treated with suspicion and branded guilty drug addicts intent on abusing the medication that makes our lives tolerable. And that's from Navarre in East Wenatchee. And Navarre obviously has a chronic pain issue. Mm -hmm. And so she's looked down upon because mm -hmm. there are healthcare professionals that think she's an addict. Right. Do you see this? Well, I do see it. And I, I, I feel for this woman because Here's the deal, if somebody has diabetes, and my daughter's a type one diabetic, and she is addicted to insulin, she has to have it. And if she didn't have that insulin, I guarantee you she would die. And this person may legitimately have pain issues, and if they're taking the medications as prescribed, I don't see a problem with it. It's when they go from taking it as prescribed. Are they addicted physically? Yes. Are they addicted probably psychologically? Yes. But if they're taking it as prescribed, no problem. It's when they go outside of that and then they're abusing the medications that it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to recognize that I don't care who you are, if you take these medications long enough, you will build a tolerance to them. Mm -hmm. Right. And unfortunately, some people aren't prescribed enough. They build a tolerance and the prescription doesn't keep up with it. And so it becomes less and less and less and less and less effective. But I think that many physicians and prescribers are scared to Absolutely. take it up that high. Um, so they reach a certain point and they sort of cap it off. But that doesn't mean that the effectiveness is now stable. It means that the effectiveness is now going to continue to drop. Mm -hmm. And this forces people into the illicit market because they're only going to get prescribed a certain amount and it's not effective. Mm -hmm. And what do you do about that? I really don't know. Well, and the body heals quicker when it's not in pain. So there is a legitimate reason why doctors prescribe mm -hmm. opiates. They, when you get hurt, they want you to heal quicker. And so what they do is they prescribe opiates because the body heals quicker when it's not in pain. And it doesn't mean that everybody who takes opiates is addicted to it. And I think, you know, our society kind of thinks that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Shannon, talk about what those drugs, those opiates or painkillers or some of those prescription drugs that these kids are getting their hands on or that adults are becoming addicted to, what does it do to the body? Well, um, I mean, obviously we take them initially to deaden the pain. Right, right. So talk about the, the physical aspect of that and why they, ha they get to the point where it's building up a tolerance. Sure, sure. So it, it causes the, um, the analgesia. It um, creates a sense of euphoria. Um, so you feel high? <laughs> um, relaxed. Okay. Yeah, just general well-being. Um, and then it, it does other things to the body. Um, for instance, it slows down the, the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and causes constipation. Mm -hmm. Well, the only um, side effect that the body does not build a tolerance to is the constipation. So um, otherwise, it, if you're becoming tolerant, it's going to take more and more of that medication to cause all of the, the, the feelings of the euphoria and taking away the pain. So, um, so more pills. Mm -hmm, more, more pills, yep. And, and you can treat constipation relatively easily with some uh, stimulants. Yeah, over-the-counter right. right. exactly. type medications. Well, there are treatment programs that are specifically designed around chronic pain. Yeah. There's a phenomenal program that I've heard about that's in Las Vegas where um, his philosophy is people become addicted to the pain. And what he does is he treats that and uh, teaches people the alternative methods of pain right. management. Uh, so it doesn't require anywhere near as much medication. Uh, probably one well, of the some great people can't even tolerate, tolerate some of the medication. Correct. I don't do well with any kind of pain medication. I just no, some people are allergic. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so you have to use alternative methods and 
uh, everything from acupuncture to Neurontin, which is another commonly uh, prescribed off-label drug that they mm -hmm. will use, in order, and it will have some impact on people's pain tolerance. Uh, there's a lot of different people trying a lot of different things because of the issue of chronic pain and that opiates probably are not going to be, I'd say within five years, the primary drug of choice for that. Mm. You know, there's one thing about that quote I wanted to, to uh, address, and that is the stigma associated with being addicted. Mm. It's um, for people who do have a genuine addiction problem, to stigmatize them, to treat them as dirty little addicts mm -hmm. is not helping the issue at all. And I think we need to educate all the professions, whether they be nurses or physicians or whoever else might come in contact with a, uh, an addict, pharmacists, mm -hmm. that there's a way to intervene in someone's life who does have a dependency rather than treat them as uh, guilty drug addicts as this person is talking about. And I think that needs to be addressed. Well, and possibly be more effective in helping them if you Absolutely. address it in that well, manner. And Absolutely. then people like to think that it doesn't impact their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know too many people who don't have an uncle or a sister or a brother or a mm -hmm. cousin or a grandmother or a second cousin, somebody who suffers from the disease of addiction. And right. we're talking about chemicals here, but there's food addictions and gambling and sex and porn, and there's all kinds of addictions out there. Absolutely. So if we're gonna look at addiction, you know, the people who are doing the judgment mm -hmm. really need to look just real closely around them, and I'm pretty sure they're gonna find somebody mm -hmm. they know who struggles with mm -hmm. an addiction. Absolutely, we have a phone call we wanna to get to. Craig in Spokane, good evening, Craig. Good evening. Thank you for waiting. Do you have a question for our panel? Well, not so much a question as a comment. I'm a board member with the Greater Spokane Substance Abuse Council here in town, and we have been around since 1982. Um, basically um, mobilizing resources and awareness and fight against substance abuse. Um, and a lot of it really begins at a very early age. We have the Washington Drug for Youth program, the Wi-Fi program that now has over 2,500 students enrolled in 25 schools across Spokane County. So that education and awareness piece, especially at home, is so critical. Um, we do minors in prevention, the DUI victims panel, and Linda Thompson, who actually lost mm -hmm. her four-year-old son to an impaired driver is the director of GSEC, just does a tremendous job mobilizing resources. But we have real concerns about the way the um, I-502 has been promoted here locally, just some of the lack of balance in the coverage of the industry and not really paying attention to the health um, impacts of marijuana. If you go to the um, National Institute of Drug Abuse website, www.drugabuse.gov, you'll see some very troubling um, research about reduced connectivity in brain areas, um, heightened risk of lung infections, and increased chance of serious heart issues, let alone the, what we know what POT does to impair motor coordination and judgment behind the wheel. So we just really want to get the word out at gsac.org um, or 922-8383 here locally to say, hey, there's a group that's been around since 1982 that's trying to raise awareness and we need help with funding. We've seen our funding cut 75% um, on the federal side in the last five years. So we we really need to recruit support here locally to get the word out about addiction and, and substance abuse here in Spokane County. Craig, thank you so much for your call. Good information, we appreciate it. Uh, media messages are cer certainly something that we've gone from, uh, you know, just say no to drugs to uh, this is your brain on drugs. Do they work, Carla? <sighs> I think the best model, and I, I say this all the time, is how we have treated nicotine dependence. I think that is the best model in terms of education, not scare tactics, not glamorizing use by a lot of people saying, I was, I was a drug addict and now I'm rich and famous and I can come and talk to you. Those, those methods I don't think are very effective. I do think education and I think support and I think lowering stigma and providing a menu of opportunities for people to find the avenue that would work for them. All, Rome's, all roads lead to Rome. And my way of getting drug free, whatever the substance is, or behavior free if it's an addiction to a behavior, my way might be quite different than your way. 
And having that menu instead of one size fits all mm -hmm. is the most important way. Mm -hmm. Heard a little frustration from Craig in that funding cuts and you know, it's, it's a lot of agencies are dealing with that. Um, how does Spokane stack up with other cities in handling um, addiction as a whole, Neil? Well, I don't deal with any state or federal funding. We're all privately funded and private insurance. So I don't know if I can speak to the, I know what I've heard. Mm -hmm. I know what I've been told, uh, that there are funding cuts. Mm -hmm. And I would anticipate that they're not done cutting funds. Um, I think the biennium when it first started was uh, there was a great deal of support from the federal government and unfortunately that dried up. Uh, that was a nice impetus of money into the system but it went away and now the uh, state of Washington is pretty much flying solo as far as their funding for mental health and chemical dependency right. treatment right. and they don't have the money. Well, and what happened is when Obamacare came in, which was a lovely thing, more people have access to treatment, but the reimbursement rates have been <laughs> slashed mm. as far as that goes. So where we used to get $30, now we're only getting $19 per hour for the same client. So, but more people are having access. So there's some good and bad to that. The good thing is my phone's ringing off the hook. People need treatment, and it used to be before, because I am a state agency, that if they didn't have Title 19, I couldn't take them in. Now more and more people, as I'm looking at them on you know, Provider One, have Title 19 so they can get in, but the reimbursement rate is not as high as it used to be. And what's happening then is pushing these agencies from doing quality to care to quantity of care. So before, you know, you, you could treat, you know, 50 people really super well, or you now you have to take 100 in order to get the same reimbursement rate. Well, if you have 100, each person's not going to get as good as care yeah, as they not used to get as before. much attention. Right. We have a lot of phone calls coming in now, so let's address a few of those. Holly in Colville, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for taking the call. Interesting program. I would just like um, about the use of medications to, uh, dis to address awareness and to beware of the usage of uh, such medications in care facilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, relative to Neurontin, uh, it, I haven't heard one person, I know of a number of people who have taken it, and everyone has had side effects. And I noted you said you do not do meds well, and I know a lot of people do not do meds well, and especially the elderly. And so in care facilities where these um, medications are advised and, and used, um, I, I would like a discussion about being aware and to beware. Thank you. Thank you, Holly, very much. Who would like to uh, talk to speak to the care facility issue? The, the, the thing that I understand is that we have a baby boom generation that is about to hit that particular area. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the fastest growing segments of the population as far as substance abuse are seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, Why is that? Well, retirement is one. Um, Available, aches, and available, aches and pains, mm -hmm. retirement, mindset, a whole lot of things. Well, culturally speaking, yeah. their age, they go to the doctor, they mm -hmm. expect a pill. Absolutely. They go to the doctor, they expect this. They, you know, this is traditionally how we set up our medical system. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think the statistic is 80% of the time you will leave a, a prescriber's office with a prescription in hand right. because it's consumerism. Right. Hmm. Yeah, Carla, did you have something to add? Well, I was just thinking, I read a, a stat recently, because people who are entering care facilities now grew up in those 60s mm -hmm. and 70s, that was the rock and roll age, mm -hmm. and it was common to use drugs, and, and so that avenue is open for uh, the, the population as they continue to age, more so than past generations. Mm -hmm. Which kind of brings to mind the issue of marijuana in our state. It is now legal, it's a legal substance. We can purchase marijuana and use marijuana. Let's sort of open up that can of worms. Is this gonna create um, more problems as far as the professions that you're in? Absolutely. Cat is nodding. Yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you how many people are coming in now and they're getting the DUIs. 
while okay. under the influence of marijuana. And it's, I know the, the police department, the corrections, they're having a hard time with this because marijuana attaches itself to fat cells. And so the thing is, is it can stay in your system up to 30 days, depending on what your metabolism is and how big you are and whether you're male or female. And there's a lot of variables. And so she could have had a joint, you know, and then three weeks later get mm -hmm. pulled over because she swerved and get a DUI. Even though three it's weeks later? Even three weeks later. You bet you, depending on your metabolism. I've had people come in and they're swearing that three weeks ago was the last time that they used marijuana. And Are so these people new to the, to the drug? Are they new? Are they, they're trying marijuana for the first time because... Well, they're, they don't understand how it processes in their body? Well, I don't think that they're new to it. Not, <laughs> not my folks anyways, they're not new to it. They've been using for a while. But, and then the thing is, is, is if you're a regular user, you could not have used during, you know, on the weekend, let's say you did three or four bowls. And, you know, then on Monday you go to work, you're still gonna have that substance in your system. And it's causing all kinds of messes with the DUIs. I can't tell you how many people are calling me saying I got a DUI and they changed it from DWI, driving while intoxicated, to DUI while under the influence. And I'm getting opiates, I'm getting uh, pr other prescription medications that may not even be opiates. Ambien's a big one that's out there that people are driving and getting DUIs with. Alcohol is still, probably number one, and marijuana. Yeah, and, the, and the interesting thing is, is the, uh, the hoops that you know, our criminal justice system has to jump through in order to get that to happen. Yeah. Because they don't have a breath test for opiates. They don't have a breath test for benzodiazepines. Mm -hmm. They don't have a breath test for marijuana. They have to do a blood draw. Right. Which means they have to call a judge at 2 o'clock in the morning and get a search warrant, which they get electronically sent to them, then they can take them to the hospital, then they can get the blood draw, and I don't know exactly what all the details are as well what they can test for, but they can probably t do a, probably a standard five or ten panel test, mm -hmm. and now they can see what they were under the influence of. And then they have cutoffs. Mm -hmm. In the case of marijuana, it's five nanograms per milliliter. Well, five nanograms per milliliter isn't a lot. No. It's tiny. Uh, my understanding is that they've also had to, because they can only get actual delta-9 THC levels from a blood test, not a urine test, because before they were testing for the metabolite, which is cannabinoids. Yeah. Now they're testing for the actual delta-9 THC, which is theoretically processed out of your system within a 12 or 24 hour period mm -hmm. and converted. And so the DUI law is actually written towards delta-9 THC, which changed everything because normal UAs, urine tests, don't pick that up. No, it's They too pick low. up the cannabinoids, they pick up the metabolite of, of right. cannabis, but not the actual Delta-9 THC. Mm. So it, it's going to be interesting. And a lot of the smaller jurisdictions, because I deal with jurisdictions all over the state, aren't going anywhere near this thing yet. They don't have the resources, and they don't have the time, and they don't have the energy, so they don't even bother testing. Yeah, which right. it actually brings up the topic of, you know, training our police officers and our law enforcement, because it's always been illegal to drive under the influence of alcohol, uh, but now it's indeed illegal to drive uh, under the influence of marijuana. Those laws are changing, and law enforcement is having to keep up. Well, and it's not just even DUIs. Many of us have seen a DUI stop before. A suspected drunk driver is pulled over and given a field sobriety test. But determining if someone is high for marijuana isn't always as easy for officers. When they find somebody who possibly is using something other than alcohol, they call a drug recognition expert and we then try to determine what category of drugs that driver may be under the influence of. Can you see this? Master Police Officer Mike Thomas with the Liberty Lake Police Department is a trained drug recognition instructor. Since the law changed, he's been busy. It's increasing the DRE's workload. It's increasing the officers having to write a lot more in their reports. The problem, says Officer Thomas, is that people think that because pot is legal, it's okay to drive. They consume it, whether at a party or their house or even in the parking lot as soon as they buy it, and then they get behind the wheel and they try to drive. That's where it becomes a major problem. Go ahead and close your eyes, tilt your head back, and begin. In response to a growing number of pot-impaired drivers, the Traffic Safety Commission is educating everyone through campaigns, like drive high or get a DUI. I really believe that it's probably made our roadways a lot more unsafe 
a lot more unsafe for you and your family, a lot more unsafe for me, which is very worrisome. Even with the increased emphasis, Officer Thomas says not everyone is getting the message about marijuana and driving. They're impaired by it. They had no idea. We arrest them and they seem surprised. Carla, help me understand the difference between alcohol and marijuana and what it does to the body then, and, and obviously our law enforcement are having to recognize that too. Alcohol is a depressant. Mm -hmm. Marijuana is? Marijuana is in its own category all by itself. Um, I think what, what I see happening with a lot of people is they will recognize I have a problem with alcohol. I beat up people, I break laws, I run into bridges, whatever, and so it's pretty obvious. The marijuana is more subtle, and so it's not as in their face. Um, I have a, a quote I use all the time from Daryl Anaba, who uh, is talking about the change in marijuana over the, the last few decades. The drug is more subtle, but it is very intense today. The, if we were to sell what people could buy in the 60s, mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't survive because people would beat you up for, t for selling junk. Much more concentrated and yes. intense than it used to be. Much it's more. Powerful. It's a totally different drug. And so people are developing serious problems with it. And, uh, but it's not as obvious. Uh, I don't think the people that I talk to all the time are saying, it took me a longer time to realize I had a marijuana dependence. Mm. It's more subtle. Yeah, anybody that says that when I smoke weed, I can drive just fine is lying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they may believe that to be true, but the reality is that is not true. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, okay, I had, yeah, yeah, I had a 0.15 blood, blood alcohol level, but I was fine. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I have to say, well, no, you weren't. Mm -hmm. uh, you were impaired and your reaction time was probably 50% mm -hmm. of what it should have been. Mm -hmm. uh, getting baked with cannabis is going to impair your death perception, your reaction time, a whole lot of other things. I mean, stoned is stoned, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be driving a 5,000-pound machine when we're stoned. Absolutely. I mean, that's what it comes down to. That's what it comes down yeah. to. Yes, absolutely. Let's get to a few more phone calls. Tanny in OMAC. Good evening, Tanny. Hi. Hi. Wait, do you have a question tonight? Well, I, 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 I'm worried about chronic pain because I have it myself, and what I was thinking was, is there some kind of stem th cell therapy that we could rely on instead of these opiates or or even pot that I'm having to depend on now, which I really don't appreciate. Okay, alternatives to uh, pain medication. You know, there's a real uh, lack of pain management treatment, specialized pain management mm -hmm. treatment in the industry. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, frankly, it's difficult for doctors to deal with. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an interesting population. I've well, it actually that. has its own category, does it not? Sure it does. In the physician, physician. And so, uh, pain management clinics, uh, m many physicians just don't want to go there mm -hmm. because it's just too demanding for them. Uh, so, there's not very many. And the one, and now the question is can you get one that is comprehensive? where they're going to incorporate a lot of alternative pain medic you know, management techniques. Uh, they're going to use psychotherapy. They're going to use relaxation techniques. They're going to use every technique they can in order to minimize a person's need for pain medication um, instead of just writing scripts and saying, OK, well, I'm going to give you 80 pills, and they need to last you for a month. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, too bad, so sad. Um, Shannon, is that what you see? Um, the pain management it's a little Maybe too, the physicians are a little too quick to prescribe. Rather than I using some I alternatives? I personally feel that, yes. Um, but I, I think that a lot of that is a matter of our healthcare system. Uh, it's difficult for a patient as well as a prescriber to say, you know, I, I want for you to go to physical therapy. Mm -hmm. I want for you to build up these muscles to take the pressure off your back. Well, the patient wants an immediate fix. Uh, it's time intensive to go see that physical therapist or, or whoever. Um, and uh, you've already gone to one appointment. You've already paid for one appointment. And then we need for you to go to see other people. And then the continuity of care between the two prescribers um, 
or to providers while we're trying more and more to have a team-based approach, mm -hmm. it, it's, there's still a division there. So um, it, it is difficult. It's really difficult to find a pain management specialist mm -hmm. who is working in one of, one of those group um, situations where you really can develop that kind of care. And to complicate things when you're trying to treat people who have chronic pain issues, and they're prescribed the medication. We tried to do it at our agency and it was a hot mess. It ended up that they were selling their medicines, trying to get other mm -hmm. medicines, and it was causing all kinds of problems. We have no way of monitoring. We you weigh them, they're gonna come up mm -hmm. hot for opiates because they're prescribed opiates. But opiates are their drug of choice and it just was a big mess. We tried, we really tried, and it's really difficult to treat these folks. So I really feel for the people who have legitimate pain issues who get hooked on these opiates and they're trying to look for alternatives. I think our culture as a whole ha sees it differently. I think when you go to Asia, they treat pain differently than they do in Western civilizations. Okay. We have another phone call from Dave here in Spokane. Good evening, Dave. This isn't meant as an indictment, simply a statement of things as I view them. We're a society that's addicted to the use of drugs in our treatment systems and in our remedies. I'd uh, like to see some more alternate, what they call alternative approaches, like you were just talking about the physical, the breathing methods for re anxiety and relaxation, and substances that are nourishing to the body instead of addictive to the body. And, and I know of several. There's something she mentioned, one of the Guest mentioned GABA, G-A-V-A. That's available over the counter. 5-HTP, yes. um, I understand, has been useful and, and helped remedy uh, anxiety. Um, there are a number of nourishing um, amino acids and herbal remedies, which have, tonight have been totally out of the conversation, ignored, and they are generally ignored by the treatment facilities. So I'd like to see big changes in how we address these issues. I'd also like to see it addressed as a brain, a, a group of brain disorders, and there's never a single issue, as you people probably well know. And, and another thing I'd like to, you to talk to, about briefly is support systems and intervention. Absolutely. Dave, thank you for your comments this evening. We appreciate it. And we haven't talked about the support system and, and reaching out, you know, beyond the addict. Carla, address that. Well, uh, I think in some ways the addicted population is most fortunate because of the 12-step meetings and other support systems that are naturally in place throughout the world and free. I always say, uh, if you had cancer and you were told that you had to have a mastectomy, chemotherapy, uh, radiation, uh, you know, you'd do it if you wanted to live. In our field, you need support, you need honesty, you need willingness. Um, you know, it, it's pretty fortunate to be able to have the, the in-place, for free opportunities we have for people to get well and to stay well. Like Neil said, treatment is temporary. Recovery is lifelong. Mm -hmm. And there are, are systems in place for that. Um, I think we still need to do a lot of education around the general population to understand how to decrease the stigma so more people will reach out. But uh, support is crucial. Support is absolutely crucial. And it's also crucial for the providers. Uh, because I work training the providers, we talk an awful lot about self-care mm -hmm. and the importance for the providers to have a support system as well. Mm -hmm. So that's coming more into your curriculum yes. as we learn more about that and yes. how it works? Yes. And sending yeah. those folks out into the industry. Absolutely. We have a high burnout rate. Yes, it's, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to work with people who you, you see a better life for them, but they don't see it for themselves and you see families go down, you see people go to jail, you see people die, you see people commit suicide. It, it takes a toll. And, and yet, at the same time, you see miraculous recovery. And so keeping that in balance. I've been in the field uh, 30 years, many of us here have been around a long time, and we learned how to work with that. 
but so many people go into the field not realizing they need the support system as well. Absolutely, you know? so. it's going to be trying and, and test their their patience and their absolutely you know, their wherewithal. Mm -hmm. um, how often do people um, relapse, Neil? Is Frequent, there a number? Frequently. Yeah. Um, Before they get healthy. Well, my experience is this is a chronic relapsing disease. People decide to quit and then they're not able to, and they decide to quit and they're not able to, and they decide to quit and they're not able to. And this is an ongoing cycle. And even when they, make, they come into treatment, for us to expect them to come in and maintain abstinence from the get-go is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. uh, we can offer them a, a, a whole bunch of support. Uh, my philosophy is if they fall down, pick them up, dust them off, mm -hmm. put them back on the track again. Uh, don't shoot your wounded. Right. Um, mm -hmm. There are abstinence-based programs where that's not going to happen. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the harm reduction model leading to abstinence, a firm believer in it, and I'm also a firm believer in medication-assisted therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a firm believer in treating co-occurring disorders at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, if somebody is losing their mind because they're crawling out of their skin because their anxiety levels are on a 10, mm -hmm. they're not going to maintain their abstinence. Mm -hmm. They need to probably to have that toned down a bit. If they're mm -hmm. suicidally depressed, they need to have that squared mm -hmm. away. If they're psychotic, they need to have that squared away. Mm -hmm. And our field in the past, and it's moving, our field in the past was not very tolerant of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I come out of a hospital-based program and because I have an understanding of mental health issues, I understand that sometimes medication is indicated, yeah. especially short-term to stabilize people. And the curious thing is that the, the percentage of people that are actually diagnosable mental health patients in the addicted community mm -hmm. is almost identical to the normal community. But we have substance-induced psychosis that once they come off, mm -hmm. fades away. I know many frequent flyers at Eastern State Hospital that got clean and sober and don't go back anymore. Right. It's mm -hmm. kind of a weird deal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, getting loaded can just make you crazy sometimes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, clean and clean sober can kind of uh, straighten you out yeah, quite a bit. 80% yeah. uh, of the emissions out of Eastern State Hospital have chemical dependency on board. They have chemicals on board. And my experience with my population is about 80% of them have chronic mental illness on the CD side. And, of course, on the mental health side, they all have CD. Mm -hmm. I wanted to address the relapse uh, idea a minute. Um, you were mentioning diabetes. Uh, you think about people who have type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. for example. Are they 100% at all times, every day, adhering to their uh, medication re regime and their lifestyle changes? No. no. <laughs> same with heart disease. Same with any chronic relapsing disease. Addiction gets blackballed because it's more dramatic and there is serious mental and uh, financial and family costs. But really, in terms of comparing it with other uh, chronic diseases that require major lifestyle changes, it's not a lot different. Mm -hmm. It's treated differently, too. Mm -hmm. A person with a brain tumor could act exactly like somebody who is actively using. Mm -hmm. When the family finds out it's a brain tumor, they forgive the person. Mm -hmm. But when they find out that it's methamphetamine and it's heroin, you don't get the same response as you would with somebody yeah. with the, so they're looking at these medical issues and what they don't realize is chemical dependency is a medical issue. Mm -hmm. It's a chemical imbalance of the brain. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they didn't choose this. I always sit around my groups and I talk to the clients and I say, not one of you, when you're five years old, said, when I grow up, I wanna go see Kat mm -hmm. and I wanna sit in her co-occurring <laughs> disorder group. Not one of them chooses this disease and yet through their best issues still end up there. Yeah. I think the other thing that fits in with all of this too and you addressed it earlier is we see a lot of people who will get substance free but go to gambling. Uh, I'm talking about that with my they students. They replace one mm -hmm. addiction mm -hmm. with another. Uh -huh. What in their mind, I never had a problem with spending, I never had a problem with gambling, I never had a problem with this. Those substances, that was the problem. But that brain disorder mm -hmm. is going to feed and need another compulsive activity. And so I think in treatment, we really need to be talking about the co-occurrence of behavioral addictions with substance addi addictions. Okay, let's work in one more call quickly. Roy in Edmonton has been patiently waiting. Good evening, Roy. 
Hi, uh, I'm Roy, and I'm an alcoholic, and I have just uh, two questions for your panel. I, uh, first of all, i got to comment that I'm really enjoying your program. It's excellent and, and great in my uh, uh, efforts to remain sober. Uh, I have been sober now for nine months, uh, nine, uh, eight days, 20 hours, and 54 minutes. Congratulations, Roy. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the... Uh, uh, truth of the matter is, uh, I haven't heard anybody talk about the uh, spiritual aspects of my cure. I heard the mention of spirituality just once in all the programs so far. And the second one is, I haven't heard any mention of Alcoholics Anonymous, which fits right into the uh, uh, discussion about uh, alternatives, which is... Uh, uh, Dave just mentioned, and uh, I would have thought it would come up in there, but I and I didn't get to listen to it all. But anyway, uh, those are my questions, okay. and thank you for my chance to uh, participate. Thank you so much, Roy, and again, congratulations on your recovery. Continued success. Um, let's talk very briefly about, the, because we are running short on time, but the spiritual aspect that, that Roy talked about and how that, you know, for some people is, is a major component. Uh, I can start. I know several other people can speak on this as well. Uh, one of the beautiful things about 12-step recovery, whether it's AA, NA, whatever the anonymous meeting, is the differentiation between spirituality and religion. And uh, where else can you go that in a meeting with a common purpose to stay sober, you can have an atheist, a Buddhist, a Christian, uh, 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 somebody yeah. who practices the Islam faith, uh, and an agnostic all together with that common purpose, but with a sense of spirit, a sense of life, a sense of appreciation, gratitude, the willingness to be humble in terms of making amends to people they have harmed. It is a spiritual experience. It's not necessarily a dogma and a religion uh, that follows that. So mm -hmm. some, yeah. You know, it's interesting because the largest group of people in Spokane are people in recovery, except nobody knows it because it's anonymous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's probably the largest group of people in Seattle are people in recovery, but nobody knows it because it's anonymous. Mm -hmm. Now there's 240 Alcoholics Anonymous meetings a week in this town. There's another uh, 35 or 40 meetings of narcotics a week in this town. There's uh, Al-Anon meetings. There's uh, Celebrate Recovery meetings. I mean, there's all kinds of support meetings that are out there for people that want to stop and stay stopped and get around to the people that have done it. And that are free. Yes. Well, they are free as long as they continue to do what they need to do to stay that way. Okay. And what they need to do is suit up, show up, and find out what other people do and copy it. Right. And, and do that. Uh, it's interesting because Carl Jung and Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, had uh, a lot of correspondence back and forth. And Carl Jung basically had the philosophy that, and he was kind of a Freudian with a spiritual bent, mm -hmm. but he basically told uh, Bill Wilson and one of his patients, he says, if you don't have a spiritual experience, you're, you're screwed. Right. And, and uh, I'm going to cut you off there, Neil, because <laughs> that's an excellent place to uh, to wrap things up. I want to thank all, all of you for being here tonight. It was an excellent discussion, a lot of important information. We have links set up at our website also with more information at ksps.org. And that's going to do it for tonight. We're back on November 13th when our topic will be living longer. And that show will include a conversation with nationally known author Dan Buettner, who wrote the book Blue Zone. So a great show coming up in November. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Teresa Lukens. Health Matters is made possible by viewers like you, the friends of KSBS, and by the following. Providence's motto is know me, care for me, ease my way. And Providence does that. I've seen it over and over again. I'm Dr. Stephen Murray and I chose Providence because I believe in their mission statement. And working together with others of like mind is a very powerful way to take care of patients. One great thing about working at Providence is that I have the technology and support for our type of complex patients. I'm Dr. Carl Garabedian and I chose Providence because here I can provide the highest level of care to children of our region. Find your doctor online at phc.org.